Hello everybody, welcome back to Major Issues in Philosophy, Distance Edition. Uh, this week we're starting on Unit 3. So we are done with ethics, we're pushing that all off to the side, and now we're asking questions in metaphysics and in the philosophy of mind. So metaphysics is the branch of philosophy that essentially asks what exists, what is there? Because there are lots of things in the world, and metaphysics asks what kinds of things are out there. Are numbers like objects that exist in the same way that tables and chairs exist? Uh, does God exist? Uh, what kind of things are minds? We seem to have minds. Are they physical things? Is it just the brain? Is the mind something over and above the brain? These are the sorts of questions that we will ask during this unit. And so we're starting with God. Does God exist? So in this lecture, we're going to look at arguments that say, yes, God does exist. And next lecture, we'll look at arguments that answer no and say God does not exist. So today, there are two arguments for the existence of God that I want us to talk about. Argument one is called uh, Pascal's Wager. And argument two is called the Ontological Argument. Pascal's wager is an interesting argument because it's not directly arguing that God exists. Right? Pascal's wager doesn't try to give you a reason for thinking that God exists in the sense of like giving you evidence that God exists or giving you a proof that God exists. Rather, Pascal's wager just tries to convince you that it's in your best interest to believe in God that you ought to believe in God. That's Pascal's wager. So it's sort of an indirect argument. It's about what you should believe rather than actually being an argument about what is true. So Pascal's wager, the very sort of bare bones, basic version of the argument goes like this. Either God exists or God doesn't exist, right? Those are the two options, either God exists or God doesn't exist. And you can either believe in God or not believe in God, right? Those are your two choices. So there are two ways the world might be, either God exists or God doesn't exist. And there are two options that you can take, either believing in God or not believing in God. And Pascal's wager, which is comes from Blaise Pascal, who did a lot of work in probability theory, Pascal argues that we can't rule out the possibility that God exists. We can't rule it out completely. Maybe we can't rule out the possibility that God doesn't exist either. But we can't rule out the possibility that God exists. There's always at least some tiny non-zero probability that God exists. There's always a chance. We can never be completely 100% sure the way we are that, say, 2 plus 2 equals 4. We can be 100% sure of that. There's a 0% chance we are mistaken when we say 2 plus 2 equals 4. But Pascal thinks no matter how confident we are in thinking that God doesn't exist, we can never give it a 100% probability. There's always some, at least some small probability that God exists. No matter how confident we might be, we can never be 100% confident. And so Pascal says, look, Suppose God exists, right? Suppose God exists. Then, if you believe in God, you go to heaven. You spend eternity in paradise, some infinitely good place, uh, and you get an infinitely good reward for believing in God, basically. You go to heaven. Now, in most religions, there's some other stuff you got to do too, but this is an important part of getting into heaven, on the at least on the Catholic Christianity view that Pascal has in mind here, because he was in Catholic France. Uh, so if you believe in God, you go to heaven. If you don't believe in God and God exists, remember, we're assuming that God exists for now. So if God exists and you don't believe in God, then you go to hell. You spend eternity in an infinitely bad place, getting an infinitely bad punishment for your disbelief in God. So if God exists then the stakes for whether or not you believe are infinitely high. The reward for believing is infinitely good. It's infinitely good to go to heaven. You spend eternity in paradise if 
God exists and heaven is real and you get into heaven. And the punishment for not believing in God, if God exists, is infinitely bad. You spend eternity in hell. You spend eternity in pain and torture. It's a nightmare scenario. So the stakes are infinitely high. You either get an infinitely good reward for believing in God or an infinitely bad punishment for not believing in God. That's if God exists. But, Pascal says, suppose the alternative is true. Suppose God doesn't exist. Well, then whether or not you believe in God's really no big deal. I mean, maybe you will be a little bit happier if you believe in God. Maybe you'll be a little happier if you don't. You'll have, you know, uh, you won't spend time in church if you don't believe in God. Uh, you won't get to, you know, celebrate holidays, religious holidays, if you don't believe in God, maybe. So it'll have some effect on your life, sure. But Pascal thinks... If God doesn't exist, then the stakes for belief in God are really low. It'll have some minor effect on what you do day to day. Maybe uh, it'll affect what you do a couple times a week. Maybe it'll affect who your friends are. But you'll only get a minor benefit or a minor harm. Either way, it's going to have to be finite. It'll have a finite effect on your life, right? So if God exists, the stakes are infinitely high. If you believe in God, infinite reward. If you don't believe in God, infinite punishment. But if God doesn't exist, then the stakes are pretty low. The stakes are finite. If you believe in God, what? maybe you'll be a little happier, maybe you'll be a little less happy, but it's not going to make a huge impact on your life. So, Pascal says, given that we can't rule out God's existence, Given that we can't assign that probability zero, we can't say it's definitely, unquestionably false that God exists, then given the difference in stakes, it's better to believe in God than not to believe in God. Because if you believe in God, you have the possibility of infinite reward. If you choose to believe in God, Pascal says, then you have the possibility of infinite reward. You have the possibility of heaven. But, and you have no risk of punishment. You have no risk of hell. No risk of the infinite punishment. So believing in God gives you a chance at heaven and rules out the risk of hell. But if you don't believe in God, Pascal says, then you have the possibility of infinite punishment. There's a chance you'll go to hell if God exists. And you have no possibility of infinite reward. There's no way you get into heaven if you don't believe in God, Pascal thinks. So believing in God, just looking at it from sort of a game theory perspective, if any of you know game theory, uh, the expected utility, the expected value of your different options here, believing in God is way better. It's infinitely better for you to believe in God than not to believe in God. Believing in God has an infinitely better expected payout for you. It's in your best interest, Pascal thinks, to believe in God. Because you have these two choices. You believe in God or you don't believe in God. If you believe in God, you might go to heaven and you definitely don't go to hell. If you don't believe in God, you might go to hell and you definitely don't go to heaven. So Pascal thinks it's therefore in your best interest to believe in God. So you, just purely rational self-interest, should believe in God. That's Pascal's argument. That's Pascal's wager. It's saying what you choose to believe or not believe is something like a bet. And the bet you make has infinite stakes. And betting on God, believing in God, is the safer bet. It is by far the safer bet. Because you might get heaven and you definitely don't get hell. And so that's Pascal's wager. And now there are some objections to Pascal's wager. Uh, one objection is just that uh, the argument is only going to believe or only going to get you to believe insincerely. The thought is that believing because you think it's in your own self-interest to believe isn't like a sincere belief. It's not the kind of thing that's worthy of divine reward. It's not going to get you into heaven anyway if you're only believing for these selfish 
sort of self-interested reasons. That's one objection. And Pascal, Pascal's response is that, look, once you start believing in God, even if it, you start out for your own self-interested reasons, you will eventually, by living the sort of religious lifestyle, living as if you believe, trying to believe, will eventually lead you to have a sincere belief. Uh, it's sort of like there's some evidence that if you smile, you will end up feeling happier. Even if you're just faking the smile, it'll sort of trick your brain a little bit. That's sort of what Pascal has in mind here, like a religious version. If you try to talk yourself into believing, even if it's for selfish reasons, eventually you'll get there and you'll have a sincere belief that is worthy of getting into heaven. Another objection, the historically the more common objection, is that Pascal only considers one God. Pascal has in mind basically the Christian God as understood by Catholicism in the area he was living in. But there are lots of different religions, and those religions might have different answers here. Uh, there's the Catholic Christian God. There are also Hindu gods. There's, uh, you know, uh, Jewish and Islamic gods. Uh, and there are gods that no one's ever believed in. There are lots of religions that... Strictly speaking, for the same reason Pascal thinks you can't rule out the possibility the Christian God exists, you probably also can't rule out the possibility of other hypothetical gods that no one happens to have believed in so far, but they might be real. They also might be real. And if any of these other gods exist, believing in the wrong God could be just as bad as believing in no God at all. If you believe in the wrong God, you might still end up going to he hell. Uh, if you believe in the wrong God, you won't get into heaven, maybe. And so we can imagine even uh, maybe there is an all-powerful being that doesn't want you to believe in it. So if you believe in God, you'll go to hell. And if you don't believe in God, you'll go to heaven because we can't completely rule out the possibility that maybe the God that exists is a God that doesn't want to be believed in. There's no logical contradiction there. That doesn't seem like it's definitely 100% provably false. So, by Pascal's reasoning, we have to include that possibility. And so then it looks like no matter what you do, you have a chance of going to heaven and a chance of going to hell. No matter what God you believe in, no matter what God you don't believe in, uh, there's a chance that you go to heaven and a chance you go to hell. And so Pascal's argument, according to this objection, doesn't give us a reason to believe in any particular God. Because no matter what God you pick, there's still a chance you go to heaven and still a chance you go to hell. That's an objection. There have been responses to it. Uh, if you are interested in finding out more about it, please let me know and I'm happy to send you uh, links and readings that you can look at on your own time or just to talk about it. Uh, but that's that's sort of Pascal's argument. So that's the argument, a couple potential objections to it for us to consider. Uh, now I want to set that aside. Now I want to move on to the ontological argument. And the ontological argument is the argument that Descartes talks about in the reading that I sent out from Descartes' meditations. In Descartes' meditations, he tries to be as skeptical as possible and give up as many of his beliefs as he can and just see what he can conclude for sure from logic alone, basically. And he concludes that he can prove to himself beyond a shadow of a doubt that God exists. And he thinks he can do it just by looking at the definition of God, that what the word God means basically, that that's enough to prove that God exists. And versions of this argument have been discussed by uh, many more people than just Descartes. Uh, St. Anselm and Thomas Aquinas uh, from medieval Europe, Christian philosophers, uh, Maimonides and Avicenna, I believe, both uh, discuss versions of this argument. The ontological argument is comes in a, a variety of versions and different flavors. Uh, but they all basically try to take the definition of God, the idea of what God is, 
and use that to prove that God must exist. And so one version, the conceivability version, uh, as I call it in the slides and as many other people call it, uh, is sort of closest to what Descartes actually says in the meditations. And so Descartes' argument is something like this. By definition, Descartes says, God is the greatest conceivable being. God is perfect. God is a perfect being. That's what it means to be God, Descartes thinks. God is a being such that no greater being could possibly be conceived. And conceived as in, like, imagined, thought of, uh, not conceived in any other sense of the word. It's the greatest being that you could possibly think of is the definition of God, according to Descartes. What it is to be a perfect being is to be the greatest being you could possibly think of. So that's premise one is just God is the greatest conceivable being. Premise two of the argument is a being that exists is greater than a being that does not exist. So something that exists is better than something that doesn't exist. Uh, if you're hungry, food that exists is going to you know, satisfy your hunger. Food that doesn't exist, uh, like if I tell you a story about a 30-foot banana that doesn't exist, that's not going to satisfy your hunger. Things that exist are better than things that don't. Basically, that's premise two. Something that exists is greater than something that doesn't. So, therefore, if God does not exist, then we can conceive of a being greater than God, right? Because if God does not exist, then all we have to do is imagine a being that's exactly like God, except that it exists. So we just imagine God, but a version of God that exists, right? So if God does not exist, then there is a greater conceivable being. Namely, a be whatever being is just like God, except that it exists. Therefore, God must exist because, by definition, God is the greatest conceivable being. So if we can conceive of a being greater than God, that's a contradiction. That can't possibly be true. God, by definition, is the greatest conceivable being. So if God not existing means that we can conceive of a being greater than God, that means that God must exist. Because if God didn't exist, then there would be a conceivable being greater than the greatest conceivable being. And that makes no sense. Uh, nothing can be greater than the greatest. That doesn't, that's just what the words greater and greatest mean. You can't have something greater than the greatest being. So if God is the greatest conceivable being, by definition, and if God not existing means that we can conceive of a greater being than God, then it follows that it can't possibly be the case that God doesn't exist. And so it must be the case that God exists. On pain of contradiction is the fancy philosopher logician way to say that. Uh, on pain of contradiction, we have to accept that God exists because otherwise there would be a contradiction that was true. There, we would have to say that we can conceive of a being such that no greater being can be conceived. We can imagine a being greater than the greatest imaginable being. And that can't possibly be true. That's logically uh, impossible for there to be something greater than the greatest conceivable being, to conceive of something greater than the greatest conceivable being. And so we have to conclude that God exists, right? And so that's Descartes' conceivability version of the ontological argument. That God must exist because by definition, God's the greatest conceivable being. So if God didn't exist, we could just conceive of a greater being than God. But we can't conceive of a bit greater being than God by definition of God. So God must exist. Uh, there have been some objections to this argument. Uh, one is that God 
isn't conceivable. God is an infinite being on some conceptions historically, and we have finite minds, so we can't really conceive of God, whether or not God exists. It's just limits of our minds of what we can do. Uh, so God, the definition of God as the greatest conceivable being is mistaken. That's a bad definition. That's been one uh, argument or one objection that's raised historically. Uh, another objection is that the argument proves too much because you can run the same thing and prove uh, that a perfect island exists, that the perfect taco exists, that uh, a perfect dog exists, and run the same argument. Basically, just replace the word being with any other noun, and you'll get an argument that's also valid. So, historically, the example uh, that's most famous is called the perfect island. So, if we say the perfect island, let's just say that's a name for the greatest conceivable island, right? So, the perfect island is the greatest conceivable island. Now, an island that exists is greater than an island that doesn't, right? I mean, an island you can go to, an island that exists, is better than an island that you can't go to because it doesn't exist. What good is an island that doesn't exist? Nothing. So the greatest conceivable island must exist because otherwise we could conceive of a greater island. M namely, an island just like the perfect island, just like the greatest conceivable island, except that it exists. But we can't conceive of an island greater than the greatest conceivable island. That makes no sense. That's incoherent. So, the perfect island must exist. The greatest conceivable island must exist. On pain of contradiction, once again, the perfect island must exist. Because otherwise, we could conceive of an island greater than the greatest conceivable island. And that's impossible. Right? And so, obviously, Unfortunately, the perfect island doesn't really exist. That's not true. And so this is supposed to be uh, sort of a parody, sort of the, a damning objection uh, that shows that the argument doesn't work as written. And this has led to another version of the argument called the possibility version or the modal version, if you want to get super jargony about it, but don't worry about that. Uh, and the argument... Just like Pascal's wager, uh, the argument takes the premise that it's possible that God exists, that we can't rule out the possibility that God exists, right? And so the argument goes something like this. It's possible that God exists, premise one. Uh, but God is not the kind of thing that could just happen to exist or happen not to exist. God is... Uh, what's called a necessary being. Either God necessarily exists or God necessarily doesn't exist, right? So God isn't contingent. It, it, may, it would be weird to say God just happens to be real. Either God has to be real or God can't be real. Those are the options, right? uh, But if God necessarily doesn't exist, well, that's just a fancy way of saying it's impossible that God exists. To say something necessarily doesn't exist just means it's impossible for that thing to exist. Those are just synonymous phrases. So, if God either necessarily exists or necessarily doesn't exist, and we've said that it's possible God exists, that means that the only option is God necessarily exists. But if God necessarily exists, then of course God exists. So therefore, God exists, right? That's sort of the possibility version. So it, it's based on two basic premises, two background assumptions. The assumption that uh, God must exist or must not exist, that God can't be contingent. God can't be something that just happens to exist. The other assumption is that God is possible. We can't rule out the possibility that God exists. God might exist. And so from these two assumptions, you can show that God must exist. Because if God's possible, that rules out the 
option that God necessarily doesn't exist, because then God would be impossible. And so the only option left is that God necessarily exists. And if God necessarily exists, then God exists. So that's the possibility version. And there have been some objections to this version also. Uh, one objection, probably the most popular objection, at least in the last 50 years, has been that there are different ways to use the word possible. Right? We talked about this a little bit at the very beginning of the course, that there are different meanings for the word possible. And one meaning of the word possible is uh, epistemically possible, meaning could be true for all that we know. Right? And the other uh, meaning of possible, or one other meaning of possible, is metaphysically possible, meaning it really could have been true. There really is a way the world could have been such that this is true. Uh, so something that's metaphysically possible, but not epistemically possible, would be uh, that I'm wearing a blue shirt right now. Like, you can see that I'm not wearing a blue shirt, so you know I'm not wearing a blue shirt right now as I record this video. So it's not epistemically possible that I'm wearing a blue shirt because it's not true that for all you know I might be. You know I'm not wearing a blue shirt. I'm wearing a brown shirt. Yeah, brown. But it's metaphysically possible. Like, there's no proof that I'm not wearing a... You can't prove mathematically that I'm not wearing a blue shirt. I could have chosen to wear a blue shirt today. That's not like against the laws of physics or anything like that. Um, it's not impossible in the metaphysical sense of the word impossible. You know that it's false, but it could have been true. The world could have been such a way that I was wearing a blue shirt. If I had just made a different decision this morning, I would be wearing a blue shirt right now. And so something can be epistemically possible without being metaphysically possible, and something can be metaphysically possible without being epistemically possible, right? So the response or the objection to the possibility version of the argument that has been raised is that when we say God is possible and that we all agree, or people making the argument all agree that God is possible, what they're really agreeing on is that God is epistemically possible. It's the Pascal point that you can't completely rule out that God doesn't exist. You can't prove that God doesn't exist. There's always some non-zero probability, no matter how sure you are, there's some non-zero probability that God exists. So God's epistemically possible because for all we know, God might be true. God might exist, right? But that doesn't mean that God is metaphysically possible, right? So when we say that God can't just be the kind of thing that happens to be to exist, God either necessarily exists or necessarily doesn't exist, that is about metaphysical possibility, not epistemic possibility. So when God, uh, when we say that either God necessarily exists or necessarily doesn't exist, Either it's impossible for God not to exist, or it's impossible for God to exist. That has to be about metaphysical possibility. Because we don't know God exists, we don't know God doesn't exist, plausibly. Uh, or at least many people, regardless of whether you think you know one way or the other. Many people don't know one way or the other. Uh, people who are open to the argument, but don't have a conclusion yet, don't know one way or the other. So to say that God either necessarily exists or necessarily doesn't exist in the epistemic sense of possible and necessary, in the sense that either we know God exists or we know God doesn't exist, that's clearly wrong. That's not true. And so the objection is that this version of the argument equivocates on the word possible. It commits the equivocation fallacy, or so this objection goes, that the argument uses the word possible in the epistemic sense, in one premise, when it says God is possible because we don't know for sure God doesn't exist. But then it uses the word possible in the metaphysical sense in later premises, when it says that God either, it's impossible that God exists or 
uh, it's impossible that God doesn't exist, which is just what it means to say either God necessarily exists or necessarily doesn't exist. And so the objection is that the argument equivocates on two different uses of the word possible. Right. So that's one objection. Uh, the objection says that God is epistemically possible, but if God exists, then God metaphysically necessarily exists. And is it, then it's metaphysically impossible that God doesn't exist. And if God doesn't exist, then it's metaphysically impossible that God exists. So we just don't know which of those two things is true. We don't know for sure which of those two things is true, but those are the two options. Right? And so that's just, that's one objection. There are responses to the objections, uh, and there are responses to the responses to the objections, and it's been going on for thousands of years, and uh, there's no end in sight. But that's the ontological argument. So there's two versions of the ontological argument, the conceivability version and the possibility version, and some potential objections to each one. Uh, and so those are the only arguments for the existence of God that I want to talk about. Uh, so next lecture, we'll talk about arguments against the existence of God, and then next week we will move on to other topics in metaphysics and the philosophy of mind. So if you have any questions, if any of this was unclear or you don't understand something, please let me know. You can write it in the comments and I'll check back or send me an email uh, and I will get back to you as soon as I can. Stay safe out there.